Okay, this is the third and final talk in this session. Um, so I'm very happy to introduce Georgina Albadri uh, with a computational pipeline for analysis of multi-parameter models. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I am a research associate at UCL in mathematical biology. Um, I'm also an SSI fellow this year trying to promote sustainable software practices in mathematical biology. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is, I've called it a computational pipeline. It's essentially just a couple of analysis techniques, tools that I found invaluable during my PhD, um, looking at a m model that involved many parameters. And then if I have time at the end, like a little bit about handling the many parameters, um, specifically in Python. So let's assume that you've coded up a model. Um, this could be an ODE model, PD model in my case, or I think this could also apply to statistical models or anything that has um, hy many hyperparameters that you might need to investigate. Um, so let's assume you've got this model coded up, it's, you know, you trust the output, it's, it's well tested, everything like that. Um, but because it depends on different parameters, um, you don't just want to run it once and have one output. You probably need to run it hundreds of times and uh, you need to have you know, n number of inputs and n number of outputs. And then the question is, well, what do you do uh, with all of that information? Like, How do you decide what inputs to use? How do you uh, investigate the outputs properly? So one of the first, the application that I was using this for was a model of vascular network formation. So it was a PDE model. Um, the inputs were the model parameters, so things like the dynamics, um, the parameters that govern the dynamics of the growth factors in the model, the different cell types in the model. Um, and then the outputs were things like, well, it differed slightly in a 1D or 2D model. Um, so in 1D, the outputs would be things like the number of clusters that formed, because obviously that's the only sort of patterning you can get in 1D. Uh, the height of the clusters, potentially the spacing between the clusters. Um, and then in 2D, you have sort of more complex uh, shapes. You might be interested in the shapes that, um, that can be produced, um, which was what I was most interested in, because so far there wasn't a like, really good standard sort of PDE model of vascular network formation that ticked all the boxes in terms of the right shapes, the right sort of stability of the shapes um, that, that mimicked things that looked like vasculature. Um, so then these outputs would be things like the total vessel area or the shape factors, as I said, like a ratio between perimeter and area. So the pipeline of my project was essentially, number one, identify a model candidate that I thought could do a better job than what already existed. Um, analyze the model, I didn't really know what that would involve in the beginning. Um, and some parameterization. So we have like a combination of some quantitative and qualitative data that we can use to parameterize the model. So first part, model selection, I think anyone in sort of the, <laughs> the math bio domain would be familiar with this uh, idea or anyone that works with sort of experimentalist biologists, they'll say it's like, okay, well, you have these like, you know, hundreds of things that are involved with these hundreds of processes and you might end up um, after reviewing literature or talking to a collaborator with like something like 25 different parameters that you think could be included. Um, and then I've just put in the famous quote from von Neumann, um, with four parameters, I can fit an elephant, and with five, I can make him wiggle his trunk. Um, and someone actually, someone actually proved the point in 2010. They published a paper <laughs> based on this principle, and that the trunk is moving very slowly, if you can see it. And it's just a warning that basically, if you want to model something, like you almost nearly can, but if you're including way too many parameters, then it's not a useful model because it's not telling you what processes are important um, and you won't have enough data probably ever to be able to parameterize it properly. Um, and then you'll have other issues with it, like identifiability. So the first method I used was uh, sensitivity analysis. So in Python, there's a package called uh, Salib Sensitivity Analysis Library. 
Um, I'm guessing it's quite a ubiquitous method, so it's probably there are equivalent modules in other languages. So salad basically provides you two functions. There's like a salad uh, sampler function, which um, gives you a list of uh, parameter sets based on your input. So you feed it the names of your parameters, you feed it the like the minimum and the maximum value of each parameter, and it will sample that parameter space for you based on an algorithm or a couple of different choices um, and give you this list of inputs. Um, you then yourself run your model for all of those different parameter inputs, so then you have the freedom to run it on multiple cores or multiple machines, however you're used to doing it, depending, I guess, on the like, how expensive your model is to run. Um, you gather together all of the outputs, very importantly, in the exact same order that the inputs were in. Um, and then you have some analyze function. Um, so Salib looks at all of the inputs, looks at all the outputs, and it calculates a sensitivity index for each parameter, which tells you the relative importance of the parameter on the outputs. So you can see, depending on the method you choose, you can see their like direct um, impact, and you can also have second order sensitivity indices, so you can see the importance of the relationship between two different parameters as well on the model. And then this is just an example of an output that I had. Um, for four different parameters, you could have 25 if you have the capacity. Um, and because my, my model was time dependent, I was looking at the, the sensitivity of the model to the parameters at four different time points. Um, so if your parameter bounds include zero, so for example, each parameter can be anything between zero and whatever you think the maximum could possibly be, then if, say, for instance, this blue line, which is parameter gamma, um, if that is sort of tending towards uh, a very, very low sensitivity index and you're interested in your model at those like longer time points, then you can basically conclude, well, OK, if gamma is zero or, or some maximum value and the sensitivity index is still coming back really low, then I can basically exclude that from the model. I don't need it. Um, and you can do this. Um, yeah, as I said, for as many parameters as you like. Uh, and you just have to be careful that you have chosen your metric wisely, because obviously it might not have an impact on this potential, on this metric, but it might have a big impact on a different metric. So you have to choose your metric wisely. So that's the first thing that I ticked off my list, is that reduce the, the model to a sensitive number of parameters. The second question I had was, what is the model actually capable of? So for my application of vascular network formation, I mentioned that other models couldn't quite recreate um, vascularization process um, and tick all the boxes uh, properly. So I wanted to really probe what the limit of the model was. And for this, um, a method called uh, particle swarm optimization was really, um, really useful. So it's essentially, it can be used as a parameter optimization method. Um, in Python, this is a module available called PySwarms. Um, again, I haven't checked if it's available in other languages. But it's based on a relatively simple algorithm. So if you really wanted to, you could code it up in a different language. Um, so essentially, uh, particle swarm optimization sets off sort of like 20, 20 particles in the parameter space. Um, they take an initial random position. The model runs for each of these uh, particles, so whatever parameter values they're representing. The output metric is calculated, and then they all um, sort of uh, learn what their like, best position has been so far, and what the global best position has been so far. And then they have a velocity. So in between running the model, they find a new position based on their velocity, which is a combination of their personal and global best position. And so in this uh, little animation, what you'd expect to see is that they're sort of scattering around, searching the parameter space, and they'll all eventually converge in what is the optimum uh, parameter, parameter value. 
And I had two model candidates at this point, so I was, optim I was optimizing the number of clusters that were forming in 1D because um, I wanted to see how small the spatial scale um, that the model could uh, create would be. So um, then translated into 2D, um, one model uh, had a pattern size of like a millimeter and another one was like 0.15 millimeters, which if you know much about biology, you know it's like far more um, relevant to the spatial scale of a uh, small scale vasculature. So it was like, okay, great. So the limits of model one aren't very great. The limits of model two, much better. So let's go with model two. Uh, these two methods can also be used for parameterization, as I said, and also um, uncertainty quantification. So if you have uh, quantitative data um, and your uh, model um, is uh, identifiable, like structurally identifiable, so what I mean by that is that um, each output corresponds to like a discrete input, then um, you can also use particle swarm optimization to minimize the difference between the, the outcome metric um, of your simulation and the real data metric, and hopefully find the parameter set that best fits the data. Um, and then the sensitivity analysis can be used again. Um, note the different input parameter bounds. Let's say you have um, used your model or you've used your data to find what you think the, uh, the range of parameter values is. Um, you can run your sensitivity uh, analysis again, just ignore the fact it's the same graph. Um, and then you can see, okay, these parameters, um, red and green, alpha and delta, um, are having a really big impact on the model. Um, across the whole time frame, basically. So that can tell you that whatever data you've got for alpha and delta needs to be a bit better. You need a bit more because the, the current uncertainty you've got in the parameter is creating a really big uncertainty in your model outcome. That's just a recap of what I've said so far. So essentially, can discard unnecessary model parameters with sensitivity analysis. Um, you can use particle swarm optimization to probe the capabilities of your model. Um, you can also use it to parameterize the model, and then you can repeat uh, sensitivity analysis for uncertainty quantification as one potential method. And then I just wanted to talk briefly in the last uh, few minutes of my talk about um, what I found personally was the best way to set up the, the model and handle the many parameters in particular. So in biology, possibly in other like, modeling areas, um, you have, as you can imagine, things that sort of look similar but have different parameters attached to them. So I started using um, data classes to set up my different um, like model components, so the different cells that are interacting, the different solutes that are interacting. And then with data classes, this meant that I could really easily and clearly um, create a, a class, data class called the cell type, and then include any um, parameters that would be associated with the cells. Um, a data class called the solute, and then any parameters that might be associated with the solute, which is a growth factor. Um, and then how this looks in practice to actually run the model um, is including some other data classes that I didn't explicitly show, was that I can set up the geometry of the, the system just using a geometry data class. I can, I've called my cell type just cell because I have one, but you might want to call it like endothelial cell or whatever. Um, I have a, a water phase because the cells were in water. And then I have a solute, a single solute, so I just called it solute again. Um, and then I initialized the grid because I was using a finite difference model. Um, and then what this means is that you just run, I was just running this function called time step for a certain number of time steps. Um, and what I thought was nicest about using data classes was that into the time step, I'm not feeding like a list of like 30 parameters or, so, or whatever, because even though you're only playing with a few, there's a lot of parameters involved in um, like other behind the scenes ones. 
So I just feed into the time step cell solely water grids and the time step. And then this time step behind the scenes looks equally nice. Um, just a tiny like snapshot of the, the first few lines of it. Um, is that each um, line was essentially just updating the distribution of the cells, the water, the solute, the time step. So just adding, um, just changing this cell dot distribution, so the distribution of my cell data class, um, cell object. Um, and then each solver again was where I just, uh, that only depended on the cell, um, cell uh, data objects. And then in those solvers I could then unpack the parameters that I needed. Um, so I'll unpack it at the last possible step because any other users of this um, code are unlikely to get that deep because then they'd be messing about with the maths essentially. Um, yeah. And here's just a uh, way you can find more information about Pythons, uh, Salib, and data classes, which is relatively new to Python in the last few years. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Let's see what Slido has to offer us. Okay, first question. Is it better to refactor code to remove parameters that SA shows have no impact or just set, the, set them to a sensible value? Yeah, I mean, if your sensitivity analysis shows it has no impact, then you can just essentially set them to zero, right? And then there's... And then it's just like a, an artifact of your code. <laughs> so I would say it's better to, to refactor the code and remove it just to simplify what you've got left. Um, I guess you could just have set it as a default value zero just in case you might have a case in the future where you're looking at something different as an output. Um, and then that would have, uh, then you'd want to bring it back again. Um, so yeah, if you set the default value zero, I guess you never see it again because you don't ever have to change that in the code. Thank you. Uh, so someone here is um, telling us about an alternative swarming library, pi n m m s o. Might be interesting to compare implementation and performance between the two. So there you are. You can, that's giving you some work to do. That's nice. Um, and uh, is the sensitivity analysis any different to principal component analysis? Um, I'll, I'll let you answer that first. Okay. With my limited knowledge of principal component analysis, I'll try and uh, uh, answer that. So, apologies if I'm wrong, we can talk about it later. What I, the idea I have of principal component analysis is that it reduces your parameters um, by combining them to show which ones are more important, that might be wrong. Um, in which case, it might be hard to unpick the dependence of the individual parameters. But if you ask me that question, what I just said is completely wrong, please say something. <laughs> um, so sensitivity analysis is like maintaining, you know exactly which parameters are having which impact, and then you can see the interactions between all of them with all of the other ones. So I think sensitivity analysis is a lot clearer. Um, but if you, yeah, I think it, I don't know if it'd be harder to use principal component analysis to actually just exclude parameters completely. Cool. I don't know if the person who asked that wants to grab Georgina in the break and discuss it at length. I'm sure that'd be exciting. Um, Thanks for your talk. We can uh, echo that. Do you have any suggestions on when to stop evaluating model choices? How do you know when it's good enough? OK, so I guess it depends how much data you have, essentially, and how much agreement you have between your model and your data. Um, I guess. It depends what you mean by model choices as well. Like if you mean like completely different model frameworks or just sort of similar ones and putting in, like taking out parameters. Um, there's quite a nice um, 
criteria are actually emerging for choosing models called, um, as you borrow, like information criteria, something like that. There's been a few papers where um, you've been combining model parameterization with model selection in order to choose um, the best one. So it was using um, it was using a Bayesian parameterization method, so that you could see the one the models that had the most certainty about the parameter values. Um, combined with some other criteria like the number of parameters involved because you want to minimize that. And then they use some information criteria, um, criterion, um, to select the model choice. So if you want something more formal, I suggest looking into that. Uh, so the next question is uh, assuming something about your code structure. Um, having created classific aggregating data, so that's with the data class decorator, did you consider going further with more general object-oriented architecture? Um, I did consider it, but at that point, when I discovered data classes, um, my code was already completely written without using classes generally. Um, and I've not had really any reason to change it into, into class format, into an object-oriented format. Um, I think it's just personal preference really how you write the code, especially when it comes to maths code, because it's hard to make it look nice, whatever, <laughs> whatever you're doing. <laughs> Thanks. I don't, I don't think you said in the talk what the data class decorator actually gives you, what benefit it is. Maybe you could tell us that too. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so essentially the data class decorator just takes away any of the the hard work and all the ugly stuff that you have to put in the beginning of a class and it does that for you. Um, so it works when you're writing, it works like really similar to dictionaries because um, I was using dictionaries before and switching from dictionaries to data classes was really simple. Um, yeah, it, it took me like less than a day to change my whole code from dictionary to data classes. Um, so it just makes classes very user friendly essentially. To answer yeah. that one. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, approximate runtime of the model, how long? Yeah, so this is um, a good question. So my model takes on the order of seconds uh, for 1D, possibly up to a minute in 2D. So for the sensitivity analysis, depending on the number of parameters you have, it does require like several thousand model runs. Um, so that could be a limit if you have, if you don't have access to a huge number of cores or clusters, um, it could be a limit. So it's essentially what you're used to. You'd have to, man you have to manually code. For me, I was just using multiprocessing because I was just running it on one machine. Um, but you might need to use something like, um, you might need to rewrite the the way you run the code to run on a HPC if you need to. Um, if you need to utilize like thousands of cores to make it uh, take a reasonable amount of time. Uh, why data classes over dictionaries? That's a good question. Um, I found data classes a lot more user friendly, um, particularly because, hmm, that's a really good question. I had thought about that before and I've gone. <laughs> Sorry? Typing. Yeah, you can, I think, have types in data classes, but it just it doesn't look as nice. I found data classes much more intuitive than I sort of manually creating dictionaries. Um, I think with dictionaries as well, you get the temptation um, to misuse them. And with data classes, because it feels like it's already very structured and you're not the one that structured it, um, it's easier to, to do what it's supposed to do. Fabulous. Thank you very much, Georgina. We'll say thank you again. And that's the end of this session.